Center Director of the Hybrid Quantum Networks. That's right, yeah. So Peter got his PhD. We were working with Mark Safran. That was when Mark was in uh, Denmark. Uh, and then the postdoc with Jeff Campbell. And then he uh, went to New York Institute. Another postdoc. Another postdoc. Yeah. Another postdoc. Another postdoc. yeah. yeah. So uh, Peter uh, is, of course, very active in, in what you sort of call solid state quantum photonics, where you sort of interface the quantum imagers, in this case, quantum dots, vacancy centers in diamond, with, um, with cavities, photonic cavities, which I think are is going to describe in good details for us today. Um, uh, and all of these, of course, will go become elements in a, in a quantum network. Uh, he will describe to us how we can, we can control spontaneous emission. But if I remember correctly, the first proposal to do um, a control of the spontaneous emission by cavity was actually done here by Ivan Klepper, original proposal back in the 80s at MIT. Um, Peter has also worked on this deterministic uh, chiral photon emission and work that he did also with uh, uh, Hans Scripter here. But that was, I think, before Hans came to our time. Um, and uh, Peter is, is the recipient of the ERC grant, Solid Theater grant. And uh, also, what I discovered was that if you Google his name, He's probably the only physicist uh, that will come on ahead of a fairly well-known, I think, uh, opera tenor of the same name, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know how he managed to do it to trick Google into this, but it, it, it is true. So, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. It's a great pleasure to be, be here, and indeed, uh, I have a... There's another Peter Lowell in Denmark that is uh, more well known than I am, unfortunately. And sometimes I'm called and they ask me, would you like to come and sing in the opera in Berlin? And I say, yes, I would love to. <laughs> I'm not sure you would like me to sing in the opera in Berlin for the sound part. But if you want some quantum physics, I can help you. I want to ask him when I meet him one day, if he sometimes calls me like. Okay, so I'll talk about quantum information processing with single photon emitters. Uh, and I'm uh, at the Nelson Born Institute, and we newly started a Center for Hybrid Quantum Network at the Danish National Research Foundation that is really uh, patient funding of uh, six plus four years uh, funding, so it allows us to also start uh, thinking outside the box, the quantum dot box that I have been inside so far and that I will talk about today. And uh, so this is really, you know, exciting to have these opportunities to also think on a longer time scale. We're also starting to you know, have an innovation uh, technology development going on, and I will tell you about some of this engineering also. There's physics, it starts with physics, I'm a physicist, but there's also an engineering side of things that start to emerge slowly. And there's also uh, this European funding, quantum flagship, we're part of what's called the Quantum Internet Alliance. Uh, um. Okay, so indeed the big vision for photons uh, is uh, quantum internet. Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could wire out the world by entanglement? Uh, so this is an image from, from QTEC Delft. Uh, what is a quantum internet? That's a distributed network of quantum nodes, your favorite node, atoms, quantum nodes, and me, science, and you connect them by photons, uh, the, the flying qubits that connect the stationary qubits. So you see already here the heart of that is a photon emitter interface. It's a hybrid architecture where you have the matter qubits and then you have the photons that distribute information in between the matter qubits. And you can say this vision very much comes from the atomic physics community and here are experiments, here's one example from the Lamp group where they, you know, cool single atoms in high uh, finesse cavities and you wire them up by single photons uh, uh, 20 meter apart on two different optical tables and you all know, you know, this is a huge optical table to trap and cool 
a single atom and, and connect them with each other. So what we are setting out to do is to try to integrate some of these functionalities in solid state materials with all of the challenges and, and uh, the dirty <laughs> characters of these solid state systems that you have to overcome to get to this level of you know, performance that you have in an atomic system of very pure quantum systems. So, uh, zooming in, uh, what we are doing is uh, quantum dots, so solid state, quantum emitters, and uh, I think this slide <coughs> kind of outlines that there has been quite some progress on this platform, going from not really quantum uh, properties, uh, uh, lots of decoherence processes that you need to overcome, to yeah, be able to overcome these processes to a very large extent. So we have very good sources, and we have photon linearities, and we can integrate various functionalities on the chips and start to really make use of nanofabrication facilities to do quantum optics. I guess some of the highlights, uh, highlights of, of, of this platform I'll return to here in this talk is that we really have very, very good uh, single photon sources, and more specifically, or more uh, more details, I mean photon emitter interfaces, photon emitter coupling, so we get numbers you know, higher than 98%. So this is essentially deterministic coupling of a single photon and a single emitter. And it's highly coherent, so the indistinguishability of the photons can be near unity. And so really the combination of this uh, high coupling efficiency and the coherence makes a powerful photon emitter interface that we'll be talking about. The killer seal of our platform is the spin coherence time. It's at the microsecond level. And this is, in my mind, the reason that you, I mean, at some point you need to go out of this box and interface it with other longer-lived quantum memories, in particular, if you want to, to really, you know, do more than what you can do with, with these building blocks. But I think a lot can be done with these building blocks, and I'll be talking about that today, because a microsecond coherence time is actually not that bad, because we can operate these systems very fast. So typical recombination times would be 100 picoseconds or so, so I could do many operations within the microsecond coherence time. And that really outlines what we are good at on this platform. You know, we can emit photons very, very efficiently with very high fidelity and coherence, and we can do it fast. Uh, but uh, we are not so good at taking many emitters, and that has to do with inhomogeneities in these uh, quantum dot uh, structures. So unlike atoms, where you really easily can take many atoms and, and um, because you know they are identical, quantum dots are slightly different. So that means if I want to scale up, it's hard to scale up to many quantum dots. But each quantum dot can emit many, many photons, and that is kind of the quantum resource that this platform can develop: many photons and few matter qubits. And you should think about what does that enable? What quantum architectures does that enable? And I will say something about that. Okay, so quantum dot is a solid state artificial atom. It consists of tens of thousands of atoms embedded in the material, but it has optical properties like single atoms. You can excite an electron hole pair and it emits a photon. Um, and, uh, and we embed them in these photonic nanostructures that are membrane planar structures, they're 160 nanometers thin, and you could make a photonic crystal waveguide, for instance, here, and then you are collecting all the photons into a single propagating mode and the guided waveguide mode here. And I would say this single photon emission is really engineering. Uh, we understand the quantum dots, we understand the complex photonic nanostructures, we appreciate the local density of states and the green stents, and you know, all this physics that the nanophotonics <laughs> teaches us, and how to combine that with quantum optics. And this physics is kind of done. So I would say now there's engineering, and I will say something about this engineering that can be done. At the moment, you're talking about single photon, single photon emission, single photon sources. We can also introduce a single spin, of course, an electron, a hole, coherently control that. And then I would say, here we are on the physics side of things, of really how well can we do that, and, and there's a lot of physics going on here. There's also engineering, and very interesting. Okay, so with a spin, a quantum memory, this microsecond, best case, uh, time scale, then you can do more advanced things than just providing single photon, uh, like up here. So you can do uh, quantum gates and, and, and so on. And uh, but. We are on the physics side of things here, of really uh, you know, controlling the spin and how well can we do that, and this physics to be understood, but definitely also engineering, and very importantly, you know, the engineering you're doing up here to make efficient single photon sources, you will also benefit from down here when you're doing the more advanced things. So I think that's an important point. 
And I'll talk about engineering and I'll talk about the physics in this talk. See how far we get. Okay, so uh, just a very few words here. I mean, the figure of merit, one important figure of merit for the nanostructures of beta factor, how well can I couple uh, a quantum dot to a single propagating mode in the waveguide? And uh, well, we worked a long time actually for obsessed about this parameter, how high could it go, and we set a lower bound on 98.4% on this beta factor, meaning, you know, I have this deterministic source of single photon, excited emitted photon, excited emitted photon, it comes like, they come like pearls in a string here. So, that tells you something about the nanostructure, how good is a nanostructure? And if I have an ideal emitter, no decoherence, no broadening processes, then the cooperativity is beta divided by 1 minus beta. So that's a potential of this platform that you get a cooperativity of yeah, larger than 60%. I think you would get about 100 as well, if you want it. Uh, but can you overcome these broadening processes? That's, of course, a very important point that we will be discussing uh, uh, today. OK, so um, the advantages of these semiconductor platforms, so it's gallium arsenide, it's into gallium arsenide, quantum arsenide, in gallium arsenide. You can really benefit from all the nanofabrication, advanced nanofabrication methods. More specifically, you can grow uh, uh, heterostructures, and that allows you to apply electrical contacts on these structures and really control the tunneling of carriers in and out of the quantum dots and so on. So uh, we're making these advanced heterostructures, P and N and N structures, and they're quantum dots sitting in the center here. And that allows us to vertically put a, a, a voltage across the quantum dot. That tilts the kind of the band structure of the quantum dot. So here you'll see the energy levels of the electrons there, and you're, you're, you're tilting this band structure, and you can tunnel in single electrons and single holes into the quantum dot. And it essentially has three benefits, these contacts. You, you, one is that you really screen uh, charges to a very large extent to improve the coherence. And charge noise is really a key, key thing on any solid state structure. I think uh, today uh, we talked 25% of the time about charge noise. And this is really the very, very important property on, on any nanostructure uh, and in any uh, solid state system. And, but also for, like you pointed out, ions and, you know, charge noise, <laughs> electrostatic force. Uh, and, and I mean, it's really, really beneficial to have these heterostructures here to overcome charge noise to a very large extent. That was pioneered very much by Richard Warburton's group that showed like five years ago, I can get transformed emitted emission lines from quantum dots in bulk samples. It was just to me mind blowing that this was possible. If you ask me, I'd say, well, this is probably difficult, possible, but it's possible. And, and you know, we had what we had done together then subsequently is to get it all in the nanostructures, get this performance in the nanostructures because of the surfaces, one was close by, and you know, what does that do? And this also works as you will see. Okay, that's one benefit, really, this overcoming uh, charged noise, this charge screen. You can also use it to tune the excitons, so by applying voltage across them, you can tune the excitons, and you can also get different charge plots also, and you have an X0 exciton, that's an electron hole pair, and X, X minus, that's an electron hole pair plus, an electron, and X2 minus, and X plus, so you can really you know, select the different charge configurations, and that enables you to do spin physics. Okay, so now to the kind of the source characteristics, what are the properties of this source, well, how do we characterize, well, you do a hammer twist experiment, right, you put pulses on the beef splitter and two different detectors, and if they never click, it contains a single photon, and that's a kind of single photon purity, and this can really be very high, that's almost trivial. That's the density of the quantum dots that you're controlling to get that number down. The less trivial thing is the indistinguishability. You take two subsequently emitted photons from the same quantum dot, and you interfere them with each other on the beef splitter, and uh, the Hong-Mandel interference experiments predicts that if they are completely identical, then they will never uh, they will always go in pair to one of the two detectors. So the absence of coincidence counts in this case tells you how indistinguishable are these photons, how identical are these photons. And, uh, well, there's hardly any coincidence counts here. So the indistinguishability can be really good, 94%, and I would say still growing. Um, and, um, and, and the reason for that is, I'll return to this, but, but, but this, is, uh, this has to do with phonons that are really sorry, the limiting processes of these in, this indistinguishability. Indistinguishability charge noise and other processes are slow and actually don't really play a role here. 
Uh, so, uh, so that's, that's just a reminder of what, what, what limits this indistinguishability we know very well. Oh, that's this slide, essentially. So, okay, so what is the fundamental uh, key coherence process that matters on the few nanosecond time scales of spontaneous emission? That is what determines the indistinguishability here. Well, that's phonons. That's the only thing that is so fast. All this charge noise, I was talking about slow, kilohertz slower. Uh, so that doesn't matter if I'm interfering photons emitted from the same quantum dot. It matters if I'm interfering photons from two different quantum dots, obviously. So I'm not saying we should not overcome charge noise. We'll return to it. But for just the indistinguishability of a single source, that's decoherence processes on the short time scale that matters. OK. So what is going on there? That's phonons, uh, acoustic phonons. And what do phonons do? Well, we know that from also serious independent boson model. You have a zero phonon line, and then you have phonon sidebands. And uh, for quantum dots, they're really good at the outset. So there's, it's, uh, there's about 90% uh, in the zero phonon line in 4 Kelvin, and 10% in the phonon sidebands. And uh, OK, you just go in and filter this, and then you are losing 10% of your nuclear efficiency. Or if you're very ambitious and want to get every single photon out, you're going to cell enhances zero phonon line. So that's kind of easy. The more fundamental thing, or the more challenging thing you can say, is the broadening of the zero phonon line. And in bulk, this broadening of the zero phonon line is due to second order phonon processes, a phonon being absorbed and emitted. Um, and uh, well, it turns out, if you calculate this, it's a terrible, complex plot. I'm not going to go through all the details here. But if you calculate this second order phonon scattering contribution, it has a very dramatic temperature dependence. There's a range where it goes as t to the 11th power. But then you can get rid of you just cool the stuff down. This is 1 minus 2 photon. This is 1 minus the indistinguishability. So 10 to the minus 2 is 99% indistinguishability. So if I want to go below that, I just cool it down to a few kilometers. OK. But it's more complicated than that, because then you put it in the nanostructures. And when you put it in the nanostructures, then there's an additional broadening of the zero phonon line. And this additional broadening comes from first order contribution and actually means that depending on the, well, that is, I start to clamp the structure, right? It's a finite size structure. It has some a clamp bit, and then it can bend. So there will be some long wavelengths, long wavelengths modes that gives an additional broadening of the zero form of line. And that is what this plot shows, well, in 1D and 2D. I mean, it depends on, on the dimensionality of the structure. Uh, it also depends on where the quantum is positioned, 1D prime or 1D. Uh, there's, a, there's some more complexity in this case. Well, we are doing 1D or 2D structures, and then you can see, well, there's some problems here, because well, maybe I can only get to 90% in distinguishability when I cool down to a Kelvin or so. How do I avoid this? And there is a way to avoid it, because when you have identified these phonon modes, then you can also do something about it. And you can do simply just clamp the structures. So here's a device proposal for how to uh, improve the indistinguishability to, on these 1D nanobeam waveguides uh, to kind of the 99.9% level. If you, are, you have the waveguide, a nanobeam, one-dimensional nanobeam waveguide here, and you simply just clamp <laughs> from the top with some cladding material, uh, some polymer or something, so that you're keeping it fixed. Then uh, you'll see the indistinguishability dramatically improved from this 10 to the minus 1, and then down to uh, this is bulk limit here, and then you know, significantly better for very low temperatures. This cladding material can actually serve another purpose, because that's also a way of copying out the photons. So if you look at the structure from the top here, then you'll have the gallium arsenide, and then a beam here. You taper it uh, so that the mode expands and can then gradually be transferred to this cladding material, and then you can couple out to a, um, a, a fiber, a, a disabled fiber. Um, and uh, so, so you can say it serves dual purposes, this cladding material. And for this particular um, uh, design, I mean, we should be able to do 99% indistinguishable photons of 2 Kelvin, and with a total copying efficiency of 90% or better. And I think that just shows kind of the potential of, of engineering this platform, if you want to engineer the platform. OK, that was indistinguishability. That was indistinguishability of subsequently emitted photons. And, and, um, and the photons were the decoherent processes on this time scale. All the slower processes really don't matter there. And we should appreciate that this quantum can emit really many photons 
before <coughs> Twitch due, due to charge noise, so millisecond time scale. So actually the kind of mind-blowing <laughs> outcome of this is that your single quantum dot source could emit thousands of photons, indistinguishable photons, not millions of indistinguishable photons. And that's the kind of the quantum resource that just a single emitter potentially produces. Can you make use of that? Well, that's a different question, and that's an engineering uh, challenge. I'll return to it. But, uh, but that's the outcome of, of kind of this insight of the, of the decoherence processes. What about if I do line-width measurements, that's slow measurements, then I'm sensitive to everything. <laughs> Uh, that's a tougher requirement than the indistinguishability, post-indistinguishability measurements I was talking about so far. And indeed, when I need, want to scale, to take multiple emitters, I need to overcome slow drift also. And if I want to use it as a nonlinearity or a, 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 um, you know, a gate, it's, it's, you need uh, high cooperativity, so you need um, um, preferably transform limited emissions. So that's an experiment demonstrated, demonstrating this in, in a structure. So here we do a, a resonance for resonance measurement from the quantum rod in the nanobeam waveguide. We get excited from the top. And when you hit the quantum rod, you're tuning it through a resonance. When you hit the quantum rod, you see a peak here. It goes through a resonance transmission experiment. We launch the light through the waveguide and see extinction when I hit the quantum dot. And the point here is that you're measuring the line width here. And these line widths are narrow, I mean, about a gigahertz. And the natural line width for this quantum rod is 0.87. Uh, gigahertz, so you're at least within 10% of the transform limited emission line for these quantum dots in nanophotonic structures, 80 nanometers away from edge surfaces and, and all this stuff. And again, the gates here are really doing a, a great job to overcome charge noise. Any charge noise would go from this. Uh, from so we're very excited about being able to do that on the nanostructures, uh, this kind of behavior that was so far only reported in Bonn. So, again, on the engineering side, people say, yeah, yeah, I'm fine with you, and you're 98.4%, and why do we care? Because you won't probably want to couple the photons out of the, you come into a funny waveguide mode, photonic crystal waveguide mode, but what is the actual count rate in the detector and the fiber or whatnot? So, indeed, I mean, you, you have to work hard to, to, to engineer the outcropping interface also. And in my mind, I think this can be done if you want to, and this I need work here. Power ah, also about these tapered optical fibers um, that you are copying to optical tapers from the nanostructure. And here's some work we did uh, in a similar direction together with Kartik, Srinivas, and this, where you take one of these uh, tapered fiber dimples and you're just lowering from the top and down one of our tapered gallium arsenide uh, uh, nanowires or uh, nanobeam waveguides. And then we, in this case, could couple with larger than 80% efficiency into a single propagating mode waveguide. And that meant, in this particular case, we generate about 12 million photons per second into the fiber. And then you're probably still disappointed because 80% of 98.4 times 80 megahertz, which is the repetition rate of the laser, it doesn't get 12 million. You're losing something. And indeed, we lose something because this is still not optimized. This was not with electrical contacts on to stabilize the charge state that you're looking at. And so there will be blinking between charge complexes and so on. Uh, but my point is, you could put this together on one device if you wanted to. The question to me is really, would you like, do you want to do that? Why would you do it? It's a, some engineering stuff. Uh, and I'll try to give, <coughs> I hope, part of the answer, at least my answer to this. Another opportunity is to work with uh, uh, gradings, and, and we recently made some, some from next generation gradings, so called shallow edge gradings, learning from, from silicon uh, uh, fabrication methods of uh, when we are able to couple with 65% into a fiber with these gradings that work very well. So, I mean, lots of engineering, you can do it if you want to. So, what could you do? Well, I told you about how to generate photons like pearls in a string. Uh, maybe I would like to have n photons at the same time to do uh, an operation on boson sampling, a proof of concept quantum simulator with photons, or a quantum computer, or whatnot. Uh, I would need to demultiplex this source. Well, in principle, I can do it, right? I just take the first, I take an efficient switch and route it in one direction, I take the next, route in another direction. I cascade a whole bunch of these switches. I call them into optical fibers, 
I delay them, I insert an optical fiber delay because I know when I generate them, that's determined by the pulse of the laser I use, and then I just generate any photons at the same time. Well, that's a tough, tough game because, as we all know, all losses kick in exponentially, so the probability of generating n photons is the total um, transmission efficiency to the n power. But we can do it fast, like gigahertz or so. Uh, so if you could do 50% everything, then uh, total transmission, then I could generate 10 photons with 100 kilohertz rate. And I would say this is probably what is ongoing at the moment in the field. Not in my lab, I don't have the resources to build this, but then all of that, China in particular, is really you know, scaling up these sources, Chen Wei Pan. Um, and then my prediction would say, okay, if you could increase the to 90%, you could generate 100 photons at 300 hertz. I think it could be done in a reasonable time scale. But, uh, uh, but do you want to do that? And, and, and how many do you want? And why would you want many photons? What is your application of many photons? Not meaning billions of photons, but tens of, tens of hundreds of photons. And this is, comes at a price, of course. Uh, the real question behind here is, so uh, is it worth to put the resources into engineering this platform? Uh, um, and, and my partial answer to this would be probably not, <laughs> if that was the only thing that this platform could deliver. If it was only a dumb source of single photons that you could do to prove quantum advantage or something like that, there has to be more. <laughs> and, and this more comes with the spin and the cluster states and the, on repeaters that I will be telling about. And the engineering that you need to do to get there is the same engineering, similar kind of engineering, than what I'm talking about to scale up these single function sources. Yeah. Okay, so, well, this is not how you're demultiplexing a single function source today. Uh, um, having everything integrated on a chip is almost like, it's like a futuristic kind of uh, slide where you have in our coupling uh, steps and so on. But we're actually working a lot in the group of putting more and more functionalities onto the chip. Not necessarily everything, the delays that you will need uh, is hard to put integrated on the chip. But, but the switches, for instance, that is a key, key enabling thing. I mean, that would be very advantageous to put that on the same chip as a source. Um, so here's some recent work uh, along this direction, uh, actually an archive today where we are looking at uh, nanomechanical transducers to room single photons. So we will have um, two uh, waveguides uh, that we electrostatically can control uh, their displacement from each other. And then we have one on here sending photons, and you can route the photon from one to the other. So that's a switch, one of these switches that I eventually would like to escape to make this demultiplexing a photon source. And the very nice thing about this nanomechanical method here is that it's really low loss. Low loss is a key here, because with no clone theorem, right? I mean, if those photons, it's game over. So these switching losses have to be really low. And that can be the case here, because it's a highly integrated uh, circuit here, so 10 microns or so, uh, that, that we managed to demonstrate 0.6 dB switching loss. And I think it could be improved even further in these structures. And uh, reasonable speed, so the 370 nanosecond switch on time, uh, is actually less important than the actual loss. You can afford to switch slower if you do it very, very low loss. And here's actually our prediction of if you're scaling these nanomechanical transducers, you should be able to get to like 10 photons with a decent uh, rate, uh, as opposed to previous work from us also, where you're using electro-optical switching uh, as a um, as a method to build switches like this. Electro-optical effects are, uh, at least in gallium arsenide, relatively weak, so that means you would have to make relatively big structures and then they become lossy, and that's hard to scale up. So the, we, are, we are quite excited about the, these nanomechanical groups to generate uh, demultiplexing resources. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the engineering uh, side of things, essentially. Now I'll tell you something about uh, what was mentioned, uh, this chiolite matter interaction that I think really emphasizes the engineering potential of these nanophotonic structures. We can engineer light, the electromagnetic field, and thereby also the light matter interaction. So it essentially comes out of a very simple uh, observation that uh, if I transversely confine light, the most simple example is Gaussian beam, I can just focus it, 
Uh, well, then uh, maximum equation divergence of E is zero. So if I have a sizable transverse variation of the electric field, then I get a longitudinal component for the electric field because the weight of E is zero. So, so if there's a transverse variation of the transverse component, magnitude of it, you see there's a wave number here, 2 pi divided by lambda. So I need this, to have that sizable, I need to have a large uh, spatial variation of the transverse components of the electric field on the wavelength next scale. Then this one becomes large. And we usually don't think about it, maybe during this longitudinal component thing, light is transverse, because we usually don't focus the light <laughs> down to wavelength length scale, but of course in these nanostructures we do. Light is transversely confined on a wavelength length scale. And we also see that, you know, going in a plot forward direction, plus set, and going in a minus uh, direction, you change sign of this longitudinal component. And that's reciprocity of actualizations. <coughs> As a consequence of this, we have a transverse electric spin, uh, and a nice reviews on this, and we have been interested in, in light matter interaction, uh, how we can use these Long-term component electric field to play tricks with light emission, and that is uh, what was mentioned. Also, this uh, review we were writing with with uh, with the uh, Auschwitz group and 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 Hannes and, and uh, Peter Soller about this uh, directional photon emission that it immediately gives rise to. Because we all know from textbook uh, first year quantum optics, uh, right? I mean, the decay rate of emission is d dot e, so uh, uh, f root square. So if uh, I have that circle of polarized uh, uh, diet mode transition, uh, sigma plus or sigma minus, and I have a longitudinal component, then you can imagine I can engineer, if I can engineer this electric field, d dot e could be optimal. But since e for going one direction is complex conjugate for going in the opposite direction, if I engineer the two, this product to be optimal for going one direction, it's got to be zero for going in the opposite direction. So that gives directional Total emission, optimum emission one direction, zero emission in another direction. So we have worked on photonic crystal waveguides that kind of engineer this longitudinal component to have this in-plane circular polarization by breaking the symmetry of the mirror symmetry of photonic crystal wave, irregular photonic crystal waveguides that are symmetric around this line here. You break it by crack plane symmetry, translate the upper part, uh, half here by half a less constant, then you preferentially actually get the right hand and left hand circular polarized uh, transitions and you can get this directional emission. Um, so then you will have this situation like a sigma plus polarized transition emits in the right direction for instance and doesn't emit at all in the left and in, in the backward direction and also leaks very very little out of the structure so the beta factor is very high uh, because of the band gap effects that we are having. And that's really the strength of this platform that you get deterministic directional emission in this case uh, because you know the photon only goes into the waveguide and in this case it even goes in the direction that you are interested in going. So you can say that's what is strange you can say of the quantum dot platforms you have a high beta factor um, every photon is deterministic, every photon goes where you want it to go while atoms is uh, usually with less uh, coupling efficiency because you cannot put them into the high refractive index material, you trap them in the less than tail of, of, a, of a cavity or so, so usually your beta will be lower, but of course you, it's easier for you to take more atoms and, and scale up in that way. And again, that emphasizes this difference. We can take few emitters, many photons, and let's go to many atoms and less photons. Okay, I think I skipped the details, but that's an experiment from some years ago where we demonstrated this directional emission, this flight thing way right? Move on, and and um, and um, so that was spontaneous emission. That was directional spontaneous emission using that uh, d dot e engineering essentially. And uh, of course, this enables other things. It also enables uh, that if I send light through the waveguide, uh, like a single photon, and beta is very high, well, then the single photon has to scatter on the quantum emitter quantum emitter and quantum dot. If I set it up so that d dot e is optimum going forward and zero for going backward, then well then the photon will be transmitted with unity probability and in this process, in this uh, scattering process, it will acquire a pi phase. If I go backward, then well d dot e will be zero, so it will not acquire any pi phase. So you see there's a difference between going forward and going backward from the point of view of the light. 
And that, of course, enables you to make uh, routers for a single photon. Oh, let me show on the next slide here. We know how to transform a phase shift into path that is sending it through a max center into promise, right? So if I have an interacting photon and a non-interacting photon, kindly coupled to, to, to the emitter here, well, the non-interacting photon will not see the quantum dot, it will enter in this arm, even the opposite arm, but the interacting photon will require a high phase shift and thereby, thereby exit the same arm that it, a port that it enters. But if you let it go backward, then none of them see the quantum dot, the non-resonant is still non-resonant, the one resonant doesn't see it because d is zero, so actually the interacting photon will end up in the opposite port that it enters. So this is really non-reciprocal single photon device, single photon routing, uh, um, yeah, uh, controlled by this in, uh, Kyle Lightman. So that's that's some of the tricks you can play. That is actually quite handy, actually, for making in isolators at the single photon level, and and uh, you know get photons to go the direction that you like them to go. Uh, there's also quite some interest in what happens when you then start to take multiple emitters and, and Peter Solar. And, Peter Harbel, I think, also has been working on this. Um, when, you, when you take multiple emitters and have this directional coupling, uh, well, then the things that we are used to of super and sub radiant states forming doesn't really apply anymore. You'll start to couple super and sub radiant states. And, and it's, it's an interesting uh, question to see what kind of states of coupled light and matter can you, can you generate uh, where you have this directionality. Uh, this directional uh, quantum optics reservoir as, a, you know, as, a, as an additional degree of freedom, essentially. It also emphasizes a nonlinear medium, of course, so a single photon already saturates the emitter, so uh, the two photons creates a complex nonlinear response, so, so also the nonlinear quantum optical properties of, 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 of this is quite interesting and challenging, and lots of current interest in that. Good, so uh, now to the spin part. Um, so I mentioned already that introducing a spin in the quantum dot gives uh, additional uh, opportunities. Um, and again, by applying these electrical gates, we can operate in a regime where you can tunnel in, say, a single electron, or even better, a single hole. Um, and uh, then you get level schemes like indicated here. You know, I can spin down or spin up of this electron, this hole, and I can uh, excited by photons to these two excited states, and then we can recombine. Of course, I could prepare the spin in a coherent position of being down and up at the same time. And if I then excite and then emit, well, then I will create a, an entangled state between the photon and the spin, where I say, you know, sigma minus now is pressed up in this uh, chiral directional stuff. It doesn't have to be, be that, that's just to. In this case, we are encoding in, in path, but it could be encoding polarization or, or whatever uh, time plane, whatever your favorite degree of freedom is. Uh, but the general idea is, right, if I decay in a sigma minus transition, the photon will go to the left. If I decay in a sigma plus transition, the photon will go to the right. I did it in a superposition state, so I didn't know if it decayed on one or the other. So I'll create this entangled state of the spin being down, and then the photon went to the left. The spin being up, the photon went to the right. So that's a spin photon. Bell state and tangle state in between that matter. Okay, the interesting proposal that uh, is almost 10 years ago from Lindner and Rudolph was inside of, well, why don't we just do that many times? Why don't we just repeat doing that? Uh, and this is what we're good at in our platform. This was, uh, it was also written up for quantum loss actually already. So I think they, they have been, well, I think, quite missionary in seeing what before and also experimentalists realized that maybe. Uh, there was some potential here that that um, this could be that, that, that kind of proposals here matches well the hardware that, 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 that I'm talking about here because we can emit many photons we can excite emit excite emit emit many times uh, before the spin decoheres uh, and if I do that many times then I'll generate a GSC state like that that if the spin was down then the first photon went to the left the second to the left the third and so on and if it was up it went to the right. And actually, if you do a pi over 2 rotation in between excitation emission, you're generating these 1D photonic cluster states. This is a brief photon example for cluster state here. 
that uh, people are very interested in, primarily because you know the 2D photonic cluster stage uh, um, are, are universal for resources enabling things like uh, one way uh, measurement based quantum computing where you're generating this large scale quantum state up front and then you're, all you have to do is single qubit rotations and that is actually a, a universal resource that approach to quantum computing as an, as an alternative to making gates, you know, making the gates for photons is of course, as we know, hard, uh, but uh, I don't want to return to. Okay, so uh, there was a pioneering experiment uh, from Israel, from the Vishonis group, on this using quantum dots um, in bulk samples and uh, so far for free photons and uh, by far not optimized. But a but, but very important step because it kind of shows the potential of, of, of these methods here. He was also using some, you know, some dark excitons and more complex uh, exciton complexes to, to, to demonstrate this effect and even without magnetic field or anything. I think it was, it was a hero experiment. But of course, it's very interesting to see, you know, the additional tools we're talking about here with the nanostructures and, uh, and the whole spins and so, how could we scale this up? Um, how, high, how far can we go? So I think that's a kind of the theoretical questions and to back up by the experiment, but they're always coming a few years later, right? Uh, well, how large can we make these clusters? How large clusters can be generated with these resources, with this platform that we, we have in the lab? Uh, but also uh, then really think about, so what does it enable? So what protocols could you then implement if we start to generate clusters of reasonable size? And, and I mean, we're talking about 10, 20 photons in the, at that level. Uh, but can you already start to do something, first step, something interesting with, with resources like that? And this question I'm trying to always pose to all the theories I come across. And, and, and I think it's, it's it's, it's important to really, you know, break down their proposals into real hardware and try to see, okay, what could we actually do, proof of concept, uh, and also what metrics would we need uh, to improve further to scale this up. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a very interesting discussion that is uh, going on at the moment. It's very inspiring. So one of the ideas, one of the things that you could potentially do is uh, to make quantum repeaters one way um, and there's uh, some um, proposals uh, extended from here um, and we were in the review mentioning some of this um, recently but the general idea is that you are I mean the standard way to make a quantum repeater is that you have a quantum memory and you entangle that with a photon and you're heralding entanglement between two quantum memories and then you're sending that information uh, and do a bell measurement between those two. And then you're entangle swapping and then you're distributing entanglement in this way. That requires a quantum memory that's sufficiently long that you can wait for this heralding operation to go back and say, well, entanglement uh, or bell measurement was performed. And the alternative way, this one way quantum repeater, is that instead you're encoding your information in loss tolerant. Uh, Photonic cluster states. Uh, so you, instead of sending one qubit of information, you're sending a whole bunch of them that are encoded in such a cluster state. And then you, when you're coming to the next repeater stage, you're doing an error correction operation and sending it onward. So it's one way computing. You don't need to report back between the repeater stations. So in principle, this could be very fast. And more importantly for us, it doesn't require a long, long make quantum memory when I have to sit and wait uh, because I don't have a quantum memory. So uh, yeah, I like not having to use it, obviously. So, I mean, that is, that is, you know, one of the driving forces for, for that kind of hardware that we're talking about here, that, well, what would it take to construct such one-way quantum repeater architecture? And one uh, inspiring work uh, is from Sophia Economos group at Virginia Tech, um, who, um, really uh, set out to explain how could you generate some one of these cluster states, uh, 2D cluster states, on the repeater states that you'll need to encode the qubit information into. And uh, without too many resources, because <laughs> we experimentally really care about our resources, so you, take, you need to take a polynomial, uh, uh, resource escape polynomial, well, what did I learn from that? But if, they tell me you need to take one or two, okay, then I listen, because then it's suddenly something that, you know, is potentially in my lab. 
And she tells us to take two. <laughs> and, and so just one emitter uh, emitting 1D cluster states that I was just explaining about this Terry uh, Ruder, Linda Ruder protocol. And then another um, um, emitter or another qubit doing a C sign or a, a gate operation on the emitting photon, emitting quantum, I'm sorry. So just two of them would actually enable you to generate repeated states like this. And this is really, you know, interesting because then we can start to do all the effort to fabricate these structures with two quantum dots in the nanostructure and then couple them with each other and so on and work towards this. And of course that's also the very nice proposal of Hannes and, and Misha of uh, only one <laughs> quantum emitter and then feeding uh, the photons back and interacting again with the quantum dot. So this is even more resource efficient you could say but you need some control also over the over the level structures there um, that, that, um, that uh, it's an added complexity. But uh, I mean, these kind of proposals are really, really very inspiring for us experimentalists because it kind of focuses on minds. So, well, we recently started to do spin uh, in, in the nanostructures, and here's kind of a, an account of where we are, of course, and people have been doing this for years in ball exams, and you need to show that things work in the nanostructures. That's a usual headache. So, so we can do spin pumping now of the of the, of the quantum dot, you have a level structure like this, you drive this transition and you will drive it over uh, in, in spin down transition with high fidelity, reasonable fidelity, but you need sufficiently good lifetime in the first place, spin lifetime, so that you, uh, that you don't lose uh, the, the, the spin state. And, and these kind of measurements we are demonstrating in the photonic uh, nanostructure, spin pumping here in this case, and revival. Uh, of the spin state by pumping back to the, to the state. That's what these measurements here show. Um, um, there's, there's some non-trivial things about polarization control that you really need to work on to get things to work in these nanostructures here because you need to you want to drive these polarization polarized transitions with high fidelity and that's really some of the things that you need to, to, to implement and, and, and again the nanostructure can you can you can engineer the nanostructure to help you to, to do some of these tasks. But these are very much ongoing things at the moment. So we use the spin control that I now can spin pump, I can prepare a spin down, I can prepare a spin up an electron here in this particular experiment. We use that to make a switch controlled by just a single spin. So uh, we send in a field through the waveguide on the grading propagate through the waveguide scatters off the quantum dot. And now I can, with control pulses, prepare the spin up. And then uh, kind of the light is reflected because it interacts uh, with the emitter. And if I were to uh, pump the spin down, well, then I can transmit the light through. So this is really a single switch uh, controlled by just a switch of photon controlled by just a single spin in the waveguide. Reasonable extinction. Uh, can be improved much more than the performance that we saw in this particular sample. And uh, uh, so these are just our first uh, initial experiments. And next step would, of course, be to then prepare this electron or hole, even better. This is for electrons. Holes are better, uh, but this is for electrons. Uh, you would like to prepare that in a coherent sort of position state. So you, and this is a Ramsey experiment that shows you're learning to do this, especially in the coherence time. You see, T2 stars is, is, is very short, 2.2 nanoseconds for electrons, but for holes this can be you know, 40, 100 nanoseconds. And, uh, and this is actually good enough uh, to do many of these cluster stage things that we are after, at uh, least for the first generation experiment. Okay, so finally just a few words about the nonlinear aspects of this interaction. Um, so, uh, um, because uh, again, if the speeds are factor so high, and I don't have much deep coherence processes, and if I send in a single photon, now I'm not in a Kyle setting. Now it's just a linear dipole that interacts with a single photon. Well, then the single photon will be reflected with beta squared uh, probability. If I send in two photons, well, then they will be actually preferentially transmitted. You can think of it as you can only scatter a single photon at a time. Uh, so if I send in two, well, then they preferentially get transmitted. They also get reflected, partly, so it, but it's some kind of photon sorting process going on. It's a distinction between one and two photons, right? 
one photon reflected, two photon preferentially transmitted. It's a single photon of linearity. It requires all the coherence processes to be suppressed. Uh, so if I put in a pure D phasing in theory here, you know, these effects are quite sensitive to that. Uh, so it's also a good measure of, of how good, uh, how coherent is my interface. So how that would mean that when I measure the scattering probability of CF transmission dip here when I hit the quantum dot with a, with a weak coherent state, if I measure the G2 as from the top, you will see a G2 that is really high, showing the probability for these to a higher photon of bonds to be preferentially transmitted. So we did some experiments on this uh, already some, a few years ago. It was, I would say, almost a miracle that we saw an effect. We saw uh, um, uh, you know, um, a quite modest uh, transmission dip at the 10% level. So a G2 enhancement of you know, 10% or something like that. And it was almost a miracle because this was without having electrical gates on the structure. And their broadening spectral diffusion really, you know, washes out these effects. So now the second generation samples we see much more dramatic effects. We see these transmission dips here, 90% in E2, uh, one to six or so, and we're really, you know, starting to get very dramatic uh, signal function, coherent non response. We've been thinking about what that enables. This is a nonlinear operation at the single photon level. It's a very, very um, favorable way of operating the experiment because I don't have a spin here. It's just a two-level system that I use as a passive scatterer. I don't need any active control of the quantum drive. Well, what happens when you're scattering is that you're distorting the two photon bodies. You're generating what's called a photon-photon bound state, some entanglement between photon generated by the interaction with the emitter. And this is, that means that it's not a perfect photon sorting process going on. It's also not a perfect high phase shift or so that you're introducing by this. You, you're making some kind of uh, complex uh, uh, operation on the incoming light. So we have been thinking about, well, if I really understand this scattering process, could I really make use of this scrambling of the pulses in a clever way so that it could, I, could, I could create a photon sorter? And it turns out to be possible that if you're controlling, you have a superposition of one or two photons in the pulse, you're controlling the pulse width in such a way that, that this photon photon bound state contribution that, that is going on when you're scattering here the two photon part actually scrambles the two photon component so that it ends up in an orthogonal spectral temporal mode. So that the one and two photon components are an orthogonal spectral temporal mode. Because spectral temporal modes you can select. For instance, by frequency conversion, Silicon Group is well chance of doing this, uh, so that you are, you know, uh, frequency converting, uh, with choosing with your, with your pump field here um, to, to frequency transduce, say the, the, the single photon component, and not and leaving the two photon component uh, untouched because it's in a subnormal spectral temporal mode. So that is our message that scattering and controlling the pulse width in such a way that this photon photon bound stage scatters into an orthogonal spectral temporal mode and frequency conversion, for instance, as a spectral temporal mode selector, that actually enables you to rip apart one and two photon components from each other. And that allows you to do things like bell measurements, deterministic bell measurements. So this circuit shows you that with such an operation and so this photon sorting operation, one and two photons apart, and photon counting a linear optic circuit like this, you can actually deterministically tell apart the four pops and code bell states uh, with a circuit like this. So it shows you some of the, one, just one example of what you potentially could do with such a non-linear You can think about making gates also, but this is more of a stretch, I would say. Uh, it would require quantum memory in order to do that, so let me skip these details. So I'm um, essentially done, so uh, quantum Lego is how we uh, brand this essentially Lego is Danish company, I hope you all know. Uh, and uh, we are doing quantum Lego, um, and uh, we have been building building blocks, building Lego blocks, and we have an exciting state where we are thinking of putting some of them together and uh, do something exciting with that. And I think the real interesting question that I also touched a little bit upon is, is 
well, what does it actually mean, and, and, and how do we, in a resource-efficient way, build some architecture, some interesting uh, proof-of-concept uh, operations with this hardware that we can do? Don't ask me to take a million quantum dots and fire at the same time and make them distinguishable. This is not um, realistic from our point of view. Ask me to take a few and to deliver many, many photonic qubits and do something interesting with that. Then we are missing. Okay, so I would like to thank the group here at the Niels Bohr Institute. I would like to thank all the yeah, wonderful external collaborations that we have, in particular the group of Anna Ludwig and Andreas Wiel in Bochum, who are growing this fantastic quantum dot material um, and are really, really dedicated uh, growers. Richard Walker's group in Basel, all this um, knowledge about the, the heterostructures, P and I N structures, and getting them into the nanostructures, that's really some, 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 some insight there that is uh, important to, to, to do. And of course, my colleague also understands this year, the Siri quantum optics group. Of, helping to address these questions of, well, what direction sh should we go with this hardware? What are the alternatives for funding? Uh, and, and, yeah, and then I would also just advertise for the vacancies, so if you're interested in joining any of this, you're most welcome. And thank you very much for the attention. comment on the correction step in this one-way quantum memory protocol that you were discussing. So I think you mostly focused on the generation, but you also need intermediate nodes to correct. Could you comment on how the operation? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So you need to do bell measurements in this error correction step. Um, and uh, we will actually, we are working this out. And this is part of this also on Toma uh, and, and Mish. And, and uh, we will be laying out essentially how you could do this with minimal resources. Uh, you need to build measurements at these uh, stages here to re-encode the state and send it on. But we, we have resource efficient ways of doing that. Uh, but uh, it's a very good point. No, we're not doing that, particularly in my group, and the other groups are, are doing that, and it's a very uh, good tool as well. I, I heard about it also today in the and vacancy centers, and I think it's, it's definitely a good tuning knob as well. And we have not implemented that. Uh, uh, you will need to get that to work with the nanostructures also, and there may be some, some <coughs> challenges there. Uh, I think it's possible. With what? Can you really make the uh, single photon sources that are pretty indistinguishable uh, using your current concepts? Can you make them perfect indistinguishable? Uh, well, could you comment first of all on this topic? Because uh, in principle, the best, well, one of the best single photon sources usually uh, in quantum dots, they usually are not indistinguishable. So usually there is a trade off between like, the efficiency and the. Uh, oh. Oh, if trade-off between efficiency and instability, is that your question? Yeah. Um, I think this, this essentially says it all. Um, um, are you thinking about something specific that, that uh, I, so, so this is a starting point. It, it's, it's about this, um, um, the, the zero phone line, and, and this is what I've been talking about here, the broadening of the zero phone line, and that, that is a key uh, uh, contribution to distinguishability. Of course, if you, you also have these phone and side bands here. And if you include them also, that will reduce your indistinguishability. I'm excluding them here. And, and I have two ways to overcome these phone and side bands. I can just filter this zero phone line, and then I lose 10% of the efficiency then my overall maximum efficiency will be 90%. And I would say this is probably fine, <laughs> because, you know, there are other losses as well. This is not, you're not 
up to the 90% level here. But if you want to be very ambitious, then you actually put a, a, a cavity around this, you preserve enhance this, and you are improving the efficiency as well. So that is a way to improve both efficiency and indistinguishability with preserve enhancement. That's another way, instead of preserve enhancement, that's also to any exit of the cavity, of the quantum dot. So when you make large excitons, then you are also reducing the contributions here in the in the in the in the side bands and the contribution to zero phonon. So that's another way of actually phonolite larger. So so I would say that that's that's what there is. Um, um, and uh, if you want hundred percent efficiency and hundred percent indistinguishability, this is not possible. That's absolutely true. But yeah, why would uh, it's not a really relevant uh, limit anyway, I would say. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? 